Welcome to Bilbica Public Library's Book Buzz June Publications. Sit back, relax, enjoy listening to a little blurb about some of these interesting June publications purchased by Bilbica Public Library and Merrimack Valley Consortium. Our first genre is contemporary fiction. Haven Point by Virginia Yoon, 1944. Marin Lawson is blonde beauty from a small Minnesota farming town. Determined to do her part to help the war effort and to see the world beyond her family cornfields. As a cadet nurse at Walter Reed Medical Center, she swept off her feet by Dr. Oliver Demis, a handsome Boston bohemian whose family spent summers in a community on the rocky coast of Maine. 1970, as the nation grapples with an ongoing conflict in Vietnam, Olivia and Marin are grappling with their fiercely independent 17-year-old daughter, Annie, who has fallen for a young man they don't approve of. Before the summer is over, a terrible tragedy will strike the Demis. In an aftermath, Annie vows never to return to Haven Point. 2008, Annie's daughter, Skye, has arrived in Maine to help scatter her mother's ashes. Marin knows that her granddaughter inherited Annie's view of Haven Point. Despite the wild beauty and quaint customs, the regattas and clam bakes and sing-along, she finds the place and the people snobbish and petty. But Marin also knows that Annie never told Skye the whole truth about what happened during that fateful summer. Seven Days in June by Tia Williams. Eva Marissa is a single mom and best-selling erotic writer who is feeling pressed from all sides. Shane Hall is a reclusive award-winning novelist who, to everyone's surprise, shows up in New York. When Shane and Eva mate unexpectedly at a literary event, sparks fly, raising not only their buried traumas, but the eyebrows of the black literary world. What no one knows is that 15 years earlier, teenage Eva and Shane spent one crazy torrid week madly in love. While they may be pretending not to know each other, they can't deny their chemistry or the fact that they've been secretly writing to each other in their books through the years. Over the next seven days, amidst a steamy Brooklyn summer, Eva and Shane reconnect, but Eva's wary of the man who broke her heart and wants him out of the city so her life can return to normal. Before Shane disappears, though, she needs a few questions answered. All the Water I've Seen Running by Elias Rodriguez. Along the intercoastal waterways of North Florida, Daniel and Aubrey navigate ado adolescence with the electric intensity that radiates from young people defined by otherness. Aubrey is self-identified Southern cracker and Daniel the mixed race son of Jamaican immigrants. When the news of Audrey's death reaches Daniel in New York years after they lost contact, he is left to grapple with the legacy of his precious and imperfect love for her. At ease now in his own queerness, he is nevertheless drawn back to the muggy haze of his Palm Coast upbringing, tinged by racism and poverty. To find out what happened to Audrey along the way, he reconsiders his and his family's history, both in Jamaica and this place he once called home. The Portrait of a Mirror by A. Natasha Jowalski. Wes and Diana are the kind of privileged, well-educated, self-involved New Yorkers you may not want to like, but can't help wanting to like you. With his boyish good looks, blue blood pedigree, and the recent tidy valuation of his tech startup, Wes would have made any woman weak in the knees, any woman that is, except perhaps his wife. Brilliant to the point of cunning, Diana possesses her own arsenal of charms, handling deployed against Wes in their constant wars of will and sparring. Vivian and Dale live in Philadelphia, but with ties to the same prep schools and management consulting firms as Wes and Diana. They're of the same ink. With the wedding date on the horizon, Vivian and Dale make a picture-perfect pair on Instagram, but when Vivian becomes a visiting curator at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, just as Diana is starting a new consulting project in Philadelphia, the two couples' lives cross and tangle. It is the summer of 2015, and they're all enraptured by one another and too engulfed in desire to know what they want, despite knowing just how to act. Sight Fidelity by Claire Boyles. Firmly rooted in the modern American West, Sight Fidelity follows 
women and families who feel the pull of a home they must work to protect from the effects of economic inequity and climate catastrophe. A 74-year-old nun turns to eco-sabotage to stop a fracking project. A woman delivers her own baby in a Nevada ghost town. A young farmer hides her chicken plot from the government during the bird flu epidemic. A scientist returns home to care for her rancher father and gets caught up trying to protect endangered animals. In a lean lyrical prose, Clear Boyle evokes the bleakness and the beauty of our threatened Western landscapes, spanning the decades from the 1970s to the plausible near future. This knockout book introduces unforgettable characters who must confront the challenges of caregiving and loss alongside the very practical impacts of fracking, water rights law, and other agricultural policies. The 100 Years of Lenny Amago by Mary Ann Cronin. 17-year-old Lenny lives on the terminal ward at Glasgow Princess Royal Hospital. Though the teenager has been told she's dying, she still has plenty of living to do, joining the hospital's arts and crafts class. She meets the most special person, Mago, an 83-year-old purple pajama-wearing, fruitcake-eating rebel who transforms Lenny in a way she never imagined. As their friendship blooms, the world of stories opens for these unlikely companions who between them have been alive for 100 years. Though their days are dwindling, both are determined to leave their mark on the world. With the help of Lenny's daughter and care nurse and father Arthur, the hospital's patient chaplain, Lenny and Margo devise a plan to create 100 paintings showcasing the stories of centuries they have lived, stories of love and loss, of courage and kindness, of unexpected tenderness and pure joy. Though the end is near, life isn't quite done with these unforgettable women just yet. Our second genre is historical fiction. Long Division by Keith Lehman. In the first, it's 2013. After an onstage meltdown during a nationally televised quiz contest, 14-year-old City Coldson becomes an overnight YouTube celebrity. The next day, he's sent to stay with his grandmother in the small coastal community of Malachiti, where a young girl named Reyes has recently disappeared. Before leaving, Siddy is given a strange book without an author called Long Division. He learns that one of the book's main characters is also named Siddy Coldson, but Long Division is set in 1985. This 1985 version of Siddy, along with his friend and love interest, Shyla, discovers a way to travel into the future and steals a laptop and cell phone from an orphan teenage rapper called Braids. They ultimately take these items with them all the way back to 1964 to help another time traveler they meet to protect his family from the Ku Klux Klan. The Wisteria Society of Lady Scoundrels by India Holton. Cecilia is the ideal Victorian lady. She's also a thief like other members of the Wisteria Society crime sorority. She flies around England drinking tea, blackmailing friends, and acquiring treasure by interesting means. Sure, she has a dark, traumatic past and an overbearing aunt, but all things considered, it's a pleasant existence until the men show up. Ned Lightborn is sometime assassin who is smitten with Cecilia from the moment they meet. Unfortunately, that happens to be while he's under direct orders to kill her. His employer, Captain Movat, who possesses Gothic Abbey, bristling with cannons and unbridled hate for the world, intends to rid England of all its presumptuous women, starting with the Wisteria Society. Ned has plans of his own, but both men have made one grave mistake. Never underestimate a woman. Our third genre is fantasy. Neon Gods by Katie Robert. Society darling Persephone plans to flee the ultra-modern city of Olympus and start over from the backstabbing politics of the 13 houses. But all that's ripped away when her mother ambushes her with an engagement to Zeus, the dangerous power behind their glittering city's dark facade. With no options left, she flees to the forbidden undercity and makes a devil's bargain with the man she once believed a myth, a man who awakens her world she never knew existed. 
Hades has spent his life in the shadows, and he has no intention of stepping into the light. But when he finds that Persephone can offer a little slice of revenge, he spent years craving, and it's all an excuse he needs to help her for a price. Yet every breathless night spent tangled together has given Hades a taste for her, and he'll go to war with Olympus itself to keep her close. Wendy Darling by A.C. Wise. From the second star from the right, fly straight on till morning all the way to Neverland, a children's paradise with no rules, no adults, only endless adventure, enchanted forests, all led by the charismatic boy who will never grow old. But Wendy Darling grew up. She has a husband and a young daughter called Jane, a life in London. But one night, after all these years, Peter Pan returns. Wendy finds him outside her daughter's window, looking to claim a new mother for his lost boys. But instead of Wendy, he takes Jane. Now a grown woman, a mother, a patient, and a survivor, Wendy must follow Peter back to Neverland to rescue her daughter and finally face the darkness at the heart of the island. The Wolf and the Woodsman by Ava Reed. In her Forestville pagan village, Ivka is the only woman without power, making her an outcast clearly abandoned by the gods. The villagers blame her corrupted bloodline. Her father was a Yuli man, one of the most much loathed servants of the king. When soldiers arrive from the holy order of woodsmen to claim a pagan girl for the king's blood sacrifice, Ivka is betrayed by her fellow villagers and surrendered. But when monsters attack the woodsmen and their captive en route, slaughtering everyone, but if got in the cold one-eyed captain, they have no choice but to rely on each other. Except he's no ordinary woodsman. He's the disgraced prince, Gaspar, whose father needs pagan magic to consolidate his power. Gaspar fears that his cruelly zealous brother plans to seize the throne and instigate a violent reign that would damn the pagans and the Yuli alike. As the son of a revealed foreign queen, Gaspar understands what it's like to be an outcast, and he and Ivka make a pact to stop his brother. As their mission takes them from the bitter northern trunda to the smoke-choked capital, their mutual loathing slowly turns to affection, bound by a shared history of oppression. However, trust can easily turn to betrayal, and as Ivka reconnects with her estranged father and discovers her own hidden magic, she and Gaspar need to decide whose side they're on and what they're willing to give up for a nation that never cared for them at all. Our fourth genre is suspense. The Other Black Girl by Zikara Dahlia Harris. 26-year-old editorial assistant Nella Rogers is tired of being the only Black employee at Wagner Books. Fed up with the isolation and microaggression, she's thrilled when Harlem Bond and Brett Hazel starts working in the cubicle besides her. They're only just started comparing hair treatments, though, when a string of uncomfortable events elevates Hazel to the office darling and Nella is left in the dust. Then, the notes began to appear on Nella's desk. Leave Wagner now. It's hard to believe Hazel is behind these hostile messages. But as Nella starts to spiral and obsess over the sinister forces at play, she soon realizes that there's a lot more at stake than just her career. Dead Good Girls by Niska Afia, Harlem, 1926. Young black women like Louise Lloyd are ending up dead. Following a harrowing kidnapping ordeal when she was in her teens, Louise is doing everything she can to maintain a normal life. She's succeeding too. She spends her days working at Maggie's Cafe and her nights at the Zodiac, Holland's hottest big easy. Louise's friends, especially her girlfriend, Rosa, might say she's running from her past that still stalks her, but don't tell her that. When a girl turns up dead in front of the cafe, Louise is forced to confront something she's been trying to ignore. Two other local black girls have been murdered in the past few weeks. After an altercation with the police officer gets her arrested, Louise is given an ultimatum. She can either help solve the case or wind up in a jail cell. Louise has no choice but to investigate and soon finds herself toe-to-toe -to -toe with the murderous mastermind hellbent on taking more lives, maybe even her own. Hostage by Claire McIntosh. 
Mina is trying to focus on her job as a flight attendant, not with the problems with her five-year-old daughter back home or the problems in her marriage. But the plane has barely taken off when Mina receives a chilling note from a passenger, someone intent on ensuring a plane never reaches its destination. The following instructions will save your daughter's life. Someone needs Mina's assistance and knows exactly how to make her comply. When one passenger is killed and then another, Mina knows she must act. But which lives does she save, her passengers or her own daughter and husband, who are in grave distress back at home? Husbands by Chandler Baker. Nora Spangler is a successful attorney, but when it comes to domestic life, she packs the lunches, schedules the doctor's appointments, knows where the extra paper towel rolls are, designs and orders the holiday cards. Her husband works hard too, but why does it seem like she's always working so much harder? When the Spanglers go house hunting at Dynasty Ranch, an exclusive suburban neighborhood, Nora meets a group of high-powered women, a tech CEO, a neurosurgeon, an award-winning therapist, a best-selling author, with supportive husbands. When she agrees to help with the resident's wrongful death case, she is pulled into the lives of women there. She finds the year different in Dynasty Ranch. The women aren't hanging on by a thread. But as the case unravels, Nora uncovers a plot that may explain the secret to having it all. One that's worth killing for. Chasing the Line by A.J. Tata. Paza rose through his nation's military to become a lethal soldier and brilliant commander. Now a general, he leads Quad's force, an extremist terrorist organization targeting America and its Western allies. The United States has just uncovered a biochemical weapon developed by Paza's group, a viral agent, and it attacks a person's nervous system and renders them successful to mind control. Paza plans to unleash the weapon in Washington, D.C. on Inauguration Day during the swearing-in of the country's first female president, turning civilians into weapons. Army Lieutenant Garrett St. Clair and his Joint Special Operations teams are assigned to stop the terrorist strike. St. Clair pursues Paza across the Middle East, Europe, and in the United States, only to discover a deeper conspiracy a revelation that his wife may not have died from cancer but was murdered. Separated from his teammates and unsure of who he can trust, Sinclair is on a mission not only to save his country, but to avenge his family. Legends of the Not Crusades by Jonathan Evision. Dave Cartwright used to be good at a lot of things, good with his hands, good at solving problems, good at staying calm in a crisis. But on the heels of his third tour in Iraq, the fabric of Dave's life began to unravel. Right by PDS, he finds himself losing his home, his wife, his direction. Most days, his love for his seven-year-old daughter, Bella, is the only thing keeping him going. When tragedy strikes, Dave makes a dramatic decision. The two of them will flee their damaged lives, heading off the grid to live in the wilderness of the Pacific Northwest. As they carve out a home in a cave in that harsh, breathtaking landscape, echoes of the past begin to reach them. Bella retreats into herself, absorbed by the visions of a mother and son who lived in the cave thousands of years earlier, at the end of the last ice age. Back in town, Dave and Bella themselves are rapidly becoming the stuff of legend. To all those, but who would force them to return home. Our fifth genre is nonfiction. Swimming to the Top of the Tide by Patricia Hanlon. The Great Marsh is the largest continuous stretch of salt marsh in New England, extending from Cape Ann to New Hampshire. Patricia and her husband built their home and raised their children alongside it. But it was not until the children are grown that they begin to swim the tidal daily. Immersing herself, she experiences with all her senses and all seasons the vigor of a place where the two ecosystems of fresh and salt water mix, merge, and create new life. Our last genre is memoirs. Nowhere Girl by Cheryl Diamond. To the young Cheryl Diamond, life felt like one big adventure. 
whether she was hurtling down the Himalayas in a rickety car or mingling with the underworld fixes. Her family appeared to be an unbreakable gang of five. One day they were in Australia, the next South Africa, and the pattern repeating as they crossed continents, changed identities, and erased their past. What Diamond didn't yet know was that she was born into a family of outlaws, fleeing from the highest international law enforcement agencies, a family with secrets that would eventually catch up to all of them. By the time she was in her teens, Diamond had lived dozens of lives and lies, but as she grew, love, trust turned to fear and violence in her family. The only people she had in the world began to unravel. She started to realize that her life itself might be a big con, and the people she loved, the most dangerous of all. With no way out, her identity burned so often that she had no proof she even existed at all. And that was left was a girl from nowhere. House of Six by Lee Tran. Lee is just a toddler in 1993 when she and her family immigrate from a small town along the Mekong River in Vietnam to a two-bedroom railroad apartment in Queens. Lee's father, a former lieutenant in the South Vietnamese Army, spent nearly a decade as a POW, and their resettlement is made possible through a humanitarian program run by the U.S. government. Soon after they arrive, Lee joins her parents and three older brothers sewing ties and cummerbunds piecemeal on their living room floor to make ends meet. As they navigate their new landscape, Lee finds herself torn between two worlds. She knows she must honor her parents' Buddhist faith and contribute to the family livelihood, working long hours at home and eventually as a manicurist alongside her mother at a nail salon in Brownsville, Brooklyn. Then her parents take over. But at school, Lee feels the mounting pressure to blend in. A growing inability to see the blackboard presents new challenges, especially when her father forbids her from getting glasses, calling her diagnosis of poor vision a government conspiracy. His frightening temper and paranoia leave an indelible mark on Lee's sense of self. Who is she outside of everything her family expects of her? What Happened to Paula by Catherine Dreiskett. July 1970, 18-year-old Paula left her house in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Four months later, her remains were discovered just beyond the mouth of the culvert overlooking the Cedar River. Her homicide was never solved. 50 years cold, Paula's case has been mostly forgotten when journalist Catherine Dyser began looking for answers. A woman was dead. Why no one held responsible? How could the powers that be? How could a community have given up? Tracing Paula's final days, Catherine uncovers a girl whose personality was at odds with the Midwest norms of the late 1960s, a girl who was caught between independence and youthfulness, between the love that defied racial segregated Cedar Rapids and her complicated but endearing love for her mother, and between a possible pregnancy and freedoms that had been promised by the women's liberation movement, but still had little practical bearing on actual lives. The more Catherine learned about the circumstances of Paula's life, the more parallels she saw in the lives of the woman who knew Paula and the woman in Paula's family, and the lives in the woman in Catherine's own family, and even in her own life. The Woman They Could Not Silence by Kate Moore, 1860. As the clash between the states rolled slowly to a boil, Elizabeth, housewife and mother of six, is facing her own battle. The enemy sits across the table and sleeps in the next room. Her husband of 21 years is plotting against her because he feels increasingly threatened by Elizabeth's intellect, independence, and unwillingness to stifle her own thoughts. So he makes a plan to put his wife back in her place. One summer morning, he has her committed to an insane asylum. Horrific conditions inside the Illinois State Hospital in Jacksonville, Illinois, are overseen by Dr. Andrew McFarlane, a man who will prove to be even more dangerous to Elizabeth than her traitorous husband. But most disturbing is that Elizabeth is not the only sane woman confined to the institution. There are many rational women on her ward who tell the same story. They've been committed not because they need medical treatment, but to keep them in line, conveniently labeled crazy so their voices are ignored. No one is willing to fight for their freedom and the stigma of their supposed madness. They cannot possibly fight for themselves, but
but Elizabeth is about to discover that merit of losing everything is that you then have nothing to lose. The Ride of Her Life by Elizabeth Letts. In 1954, a 63 year old Maine farmer, Annie Wilkins, embarked on an impossible journey. She had no money, no family, and she just lost her farm, and her doctor had given her only two years to live. But Annie wanted to see the Pacific Ocean before she died. She ignored her doctor's advice to move into the country charity home. Instead, she bought a cast-off brown gelding named Tarzan, doned men's dungarees, and headed south in mid-November, hoping to beat the snow. Annie had little idea of what to expect beyond her royal crossroads. She didn't even have a map, but she did have her ex racehorse, her faithful mutt, in her own unfailing belief that Americans would treat a stranger with kindness.